All right, turning your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Actually, let's go back to 119 and let me give you a run up um, through verse 3 of chapter 2. Now, the reason why is if you look at the very beginning, in my English translation, it says, but false prophets there at chapter 2 1. That means that it's an extension of a thought, it goes back into the previous chapter. To pick up the thought. So I'm going to pick up with that, with that uh, paragraph that goes before it in verse number 19. By the way, that's a good thing for me to say. I know we all have our preferences with Bibles, but uh, a, a good thing for you to have. Now, it's, it's just the editor's thought, right? It's not, um, the, there, there's no paragraph markings in, in the original documents. They were written, in fact, there weren't any spaces in the original documents. They just wrote it all letter, 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 all the way across. It's interesting to see. Uh, you can read it if you've been trained to, but it's, it's difficult. I digress. Let me get back to it. If, you, if, you buy, if you're looking to buy a new Bible, it might help to buy one that has paragraph indentions. Uh, the old King James used to have the paragraph marker at the beginning, which is the backwards P with a double stem. You know what I'm saying? It, and so anything that will show you where they think that the paragraph begins is a real help to studying God's Word because you can put the thoughts together that go together. And it, may, it helps you understand. Um, I, I've said this before, but I can't really overemphasize it. Even though the Bible is Scripture, and even though the Bible is inspired by God, it reads just like any other book we read or letter we read or anything else. You, all the rules apply. Uh, you can't take one verse out of context and think you understand it all. It all they, they go together. They're written logically. Our God is a God of order and logic, and you can use reason to understand. Now, I believe that the Holy Spirit ultimately gives us illumination to understand the Word in ways that a person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit can. However, it's still written in a way that can be understood using normal grammar rules, normal syntax rules. And, uh, and so I would encourage you to see that. Let's go back to verse 19, chapter 1. Let me get a running start at this. So we have the prophetic Word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Get the picture that he's using. He's saying that the word of God is like a lamp at night and that when Jesus returns, day will come. But until that day comes, the word of God lights our path, if you use that word, or lights our room, lights our space, it brings light to us. That's what he's saying in verse 19. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be blind, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep." And so let's turn back. We're gonna, I'm going to bring back to a little bit of an introduction uh, or just remind you of the introduction from last week and show you the significance of the letter of 2 Peter, what it adds to our knowledge of Scripture and to our knowledge of the Lord. First, it, it speaks specifically about inspiration of the Scriptures. We have very strong, uh, between this and First Timothy, I mean Second Timothy, we have strong understanding of what the Scriptures are. So here we recognize that it's the Holy Spirit of God moving in the hearts of men in order to write these Scriptures. No, no prophecy has ever been made by human will, but by the Holy Spirit who moved on these men of old. Um, and so you see that. So it speaks strongly to the inspiration of the Scriptures. 
And then chapter 2, where we are today, it warns strongly of false teaching. And so we'll see that. I'm gonna, we're going to examine this in detail in just a minute. And then it reminds us about the coming day of the Lord. In fact, his transition is um, that the false teachers will ultimately be judged, condemned, and punished in the coming of the Lord. And so that's, that's the way he transitions from chapter 2 to 3. And then it says, in, in light of this coming day of the Lord, uh, we ought to live in holiness and godliness. That... that um, the word fear isn't used in this way, but I want you to understand that we ought to recognize that if we were to walk away from God, that we would be in living in fear or in anticipation of that swift judgment that's going to come when the Lord, when the Lord returns. And so that ought to provoke us to stay close to the Lord, to pursue Him. So it's not that that we ought to be afraid of God, it's that we ought to be afraid of what our hearts will lead us to do if we wander away from God. Does that make sense? So we're going to look at all this. I just wanted you to see in the outline, not really the outline, but in, the, in what, it's, what he's doing, this is a very tightly written letter. Um, it, it doesn't spread out over lots of different discussions. It's very tightly written. It's, we have God's Word, we ought to stick to God's word because there are going to be false prophets and the Lord is going to return and judge those false prophets and anybody else who is living an ungodly way. So that's really the, the whole Second Peter in a nutshell. So let's pick up there. Um, here's the outline. Uh, so you, we're going to be on number five and notice the corruption of false teaching. I did one to four last week as the scriptures are the foundation of our faith and what God's going to do for us. And then starting here, we're going to see this corruption of false teaching. So I want you to listen. I'm going to pick up again in verse 4, and I'm just going to read to the end of chapter 2, and then we'll talk about it uh, together. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment... And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he, bought, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime, they are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression. For a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man has overcome, by this he is enslaved." 
For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. So this is all brought about by his reflection on those who are false teachers among the congregation or among Christianity. Um, notice he says several things repetitively about them. Which words that I read did you hear over and over again? Sensuality, that is a great one. Now what is sensuality? It is lust, but it's not merely um, sexual lust. It's, it's, it's passion. I'm going to use the word passion just because when we think lust, we immediately think sex. I'm going to use the word passion because it's in Greek, it's the same. Uh, it's the passion to please the flesh. So it can be sex, but it also can be food or drink or money or comfort or any of those other kinds of things that would take us away from um, a, a life that calls us to walk with Jesus, calls us to, to walk with God and to live our holy lives. So sensuality, that's one word he used to describe. What's another word you're, you heard over and over again? Has to do with money. Greed. That's right, greed. And so what you see is this idea, this, and, and these are really twin, twin principles, comfort and greed. And it says that comfort and greed lead these people astray. Uh, and then he describes ways in which they were led astray. So that's one of these themes in chapter 2 that I want you to see. So what was happening was there were, there were teachers who professed to be teachers of, of Christ, teachers of righteousness, who came in and instead they taught comfort and greed. They taught riches. And not only did they teach comfort and greed, but they were themselves motivated by comfort and greed. And notice that what he says is that they were like wild animals in that way. And so what this means is, is that they were surrendered to um, the control of their own passions or the control of their own um, uh, fleshliness, sinfulness. And so, and the reason why is if you look there and you see in verse uh, 12, but these like unreasoning animals, uh, notice that they, they don't have a choice. When, they, when we surrender to our flesh, we are controlled by it. In fact, later he says that when you're overcome, the things that overcome you enslave you. And so uh, there's this idea that says if you're chasing after the, the, the pleasures of the flesh or the ple pleasures of, of, of just your own humanness, um, Paul used the word, their God is their belly. And, and what it means is that you're, you're serving yourself. And when you're serving yourself, he says that this is the heart of false prophecy. Now, I want you to understand, and I'm not going to name names, but I want you to understand that we are in a culture, even in a Christian culture, I use that word very, very loosely, but even in a Christian culture that is chasing headlong after this kind of, of teaching, comfort, greed, your best life now, to steal somebody else's slogan, that leads us away from the way of the cross. Remember in 1 Peter, Peter reminds us that we're to follow Jesus and that Jesus suffered for us and we should also recognize that it might be that we're to suffer for him and for others. And, and so the opposite of that is saying we want to be comfortable we're not going to follow Jesus into tough places. We just want pleasure. We just want money. We just want comfort. We just want our best life. And friends, that is exactly what he's critiquing here in chapter 2. 
as false teaching, and it's all over. You can walk into your nearest bookstore. If we had a Lifeway, I'd say Lifeway. We don't have them anymore. But whatever your nearest Christian bookstore is, or go to Barnes and Noble or wherever and go to the spirituality section, and you will see row after row after row after row of, of books that support the thing that Peter says we ought to run away from. And those are in Christian but I imagine, I've not ever done this, I imagine I could walk right now into our library and pull six of them off the shelf. Because we have been inundated, we have been seduced by the thought that we ought to be happy and wealthy if we belong to Jesus. And that's not the biblical truth. Those are interpretations. If you go back into chapter one and read, those are interpretations of men. And that's exactly what he is, he is condemning. And so that's the first thing that I want you to see. Those two words, greed and sensuality, run throughout all of this. The second thing that I want you to see is that God will punish those false teachers. They are going to be punished. And he, and he uses three examples. What three, well, four examples if you go to the end of that chapter. What four examples does he use of punishment? And they're, they're historically in order. Okay, Noah is the second one that he says. That's the third one he says. The angels is the first one that he says. The angels in, in order, uh, I'm sorry, it's not first one. It's first one in history. In the history, my, my, my mind went bad. You are right, Jeff. You went to the first one and did it exactly right. I said you were wrong and you're not. So forgive me. But yeah, so, so the first one is, is, are those who are living. Now remember, what were the days of Noah like? Everybody did whatever they wanted to do. Now in, in some ways, we think that that meant complete unrighteousness and that's why God judged them. And it was but when Jesus says that when the Son of Man comes, it'll be like the days of Noah, notice it meant they were just going on with their regular lives. They didn't realize that they were being violent and ungodly. They were just doing it. They were like these wild animals, just living by instinct, just doing whatever seemed right to them. And so with, in the days of Noah, God destroyed the earth by the flood and by the way, yes, I absolutely believe it was a universal flood. The whole earth was flooded. Not just, <laughs> I told you the story when we were going through Old Testament survey. My favorite, I always think of this. I have a, a meek and mild professor. Old so I have, I have two Old Testament professors that I love. One was not meek and mild. That's Dr. Dave Skinner. And he's the one that I tell you about all the time. The other one is a guy named Steve Miller. And uh, not the band, but, uh, but the professor. Um, it was funny, as another aside, he had a bus in, in uh, he was showing his pictures from Israel one time, and on his bus it said the Steve Miller group. And I was like, well, that's weird. But uh, it's not the Steve Miller band, it's just Steve Miller. But Dr. Miller is meek and mild, just really quiet, kind. Um, he never heard a fly. I mean, just the sweetest Christian man you could imagine. And he was up preaching about Noah and the flood one time, and he was talking about how it was a universal flood. The whole earth flooded when God caused the, the, the rains to come down. And he said, because if it was just a local flood, I mean, it took, it took uh, Noah 80 years, 100 years to, to build the ark. He could have just moved. <laughs> and so it was just that. Whenever I think about the universal flood, I think, well, Noah could have just moved if it wasn't. But so the whole earth was destroyed, and only eight people were saved from that, Noah and his family, through the ark. And so notice that God destroyed the earth because of this drive to sensuality and to greed. The second that, that Brother Jeff mentioned is Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. And, uh, and so uh, you'll remember that story. Um, it's, it's interesting that Peter calls him righteous Lot. We often talk ugly about Lot because he chose the better part. Notice that he was inclined to comfort and greed. He chose Sodom and Gomorrah because of the, the lushness 
of the of the valley, the lushness of the of the but he was still a righteous man. He was still saved man, if you want to use our, ter- our terminology. He belonged to the Lord. And here it says that it grieved him, that he was grieved by the actions of those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, by the way, which had to do with lust and sensuality. Now, we don't, excuse me, we don't know if, uh, if Lot was always grieved, like he lived day by day grieved, or if it was only when God brought the angels there and the men tried to have their way with him that it grieved him. But either way, he repented. And the way that we know that he repented is he left. That's right. He left. That is the picture perfect or the perfect picture of repentance. He left. He turned around and went the other way. And so we, and then, you know, God rained down fire and brimstone onto Sodom and Gomorrah and completely destroyed it. So we have those two. And then the third one that, that uh, Claudette mentioned were the angels. And we're talking about the original um, rebellious angels, uh, the third of heaven that the great dragon swept down with him with his tail that says in, in Revelation, that third rejected the Lord, rebelled, and they are held, in some, some of them are held in chains. Some of them, I believe, are still loose, but uh, eventually they will all ultimately be punished and destroyed. And then the fourth one that he mentions is what? Balaam. Does anybody remember the story of Balaam? Y'all do, okay? So you remember that was Balaam a true prophet or a false prophet? He was a true prophet. He was a true prophet. What was his problem in being a true prophet? He was greedy. That's right. He was greedy. Because remember the king, Balak, offered him lots of money. And and at first, he didn't know who it was that he was supposed to curse. He was just going to, he was just like a prophet for hire, right? So he was going to go and make this curse on this people. And uh, so when he got there, God did not let him curse them. He said, those are my people. You're not going to curse them. And so Balaam said, no, I'm, I won't do it. Three times, three times. Actually, the first time the Lord said, don't go. And then the king, Balak, offered him a little bit more money. And he, he asked the Lord again, can I, oh, please let me go so I can go get money. And so God said, go. And so he gets on his donkey and gets ready to go. And yet standing in his way is the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword. Now, what do you think the angel of the Lord was going to do to Balaam? He was going to kill him. He was going to kill him. Balaam was on his way to die. And then the donkey, who was smarter than Balaam, saw the angel of the Lord and turned aside. And what did Balaam do? He smacked it. So the angel started moving again, and the angel of the Lord moved him up against the wall, and his foot got caught. The, the, uh, Balaam's foot got caught, and what did Balaam do again? He smacked him again. And then he moved off on a third time, and the donkey just stopped. And what did he do? He smacked him again three times. And then what happened? The donkey said, why would you hit me three times? Now, that is a come-to-Jesus meeting in every literal way there is. Right? So, um, so <laughs> and then God opened his eyes, and he saw that he almost was dead, and that the donkey had spared him those three times. He goes on and he's, he goes on and he's going to curse the people, but God didn't let him. And so three times he blesses the people instead of curses them. So here, the illustration is not someone who was destroyed by God, but someone who was motivated by greed to do something that God didn't want them to do, even though he was a true prophet, even though he had conversations with the Lord. 
And so we just have to recognize that our motivations really do matter in the way that we interact with God and what he has for us. In fact, our motives matter almost more than our actions matter because our actions are simply a reflection of our motives. And it's from the heart that brings us to do these kinds, these kinds of issues or, or, or responses. Uh, it's, why, it's why Jesus in Matthew, or not, maybe not why, but it's reflective of, it's reflected in Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Notice that that hunger and thirst is somewhat of a righteous passion, right? So if we say that sensuality is an unrighteous passion, that we're driven by our animal instincts, if we will, then hunger and thirsting for righteousness is the opposite of that, we're driven by our godly desires, those that appeal to righteousness and godliness. And, and so that's, that's the opposite of the way that we, so our, our motives really matter. So that's the second thing I want you to see, that he uses the illustration of four Old Testament issues to show that God judges. But there's, to quote the Ginsu Knives commercial, but wait, there's more. Not only is he proving that God is going to judge those who are unrighteous, he also shows us the right in the middle of God's judgment that he rescues the righteous. Think about every single one of those illustrations he just used. In fact, let me read verse number 9. Look at verse number 9 of chapter 2. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. So what I want you to see is that God's judgment, this should sound familiar, and his salvation or rescue come in the same package. So let's go back and think. Noah rescued. Lot, rescued. Balaam, rescued. All by the supernatural activity of God, both through God's prophetic word. Remember, that's the tie to chapter one. We have these precious promises, the prophetic word. God spoke to Noah. The Lord spoke to Lot. The Lord spoke to Balaam, you see? And so the Lord speaks to us now, and it's through his speaking to us that we are rescued. But when he comes, and we're going to see this in chapter 3, when he comes, he is going to bring both judgment for the ungodly and rescue for the godly. Because the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. And not just from temptation, but also from his own judgment. And so we don't have to fear. I know what we, I know what we do. We look around at our nation, because I do this too, and I'm thinking, man, it's going to hurt really, really, really bad when our nation falls. It's going to hurt. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to physically hurt Christians. But that doesn't mean we're being judged. It doesn't mean that we're going to suffer the wrath of God just because we go through difficulty. The whole New Testament tells us that we're going to go through difficulty, the whole thing. One of the reasons, and, and, and I want to be really, really super careful the way I apply this, but it's possible that one of the reasons that we don't think that we ought to go through suffering is because we've listened to too many false prophets who told us we wouldn't. I mean, this is the, this is the picture. No, he's going to take care of you. Everything's going to be okay in the, in the, in the physical way, in the, in the comfort way. But I want you to know right now, there are people who call, who call themselves by the name of Jesus all around the world who are being killed and suffering right now. Why do we think that God owes it to American Christians something different that he's not giving 
Vietnamese Christians or North Korean Christians or Iranian Christians. And so I, I just want you to know that we have to be careful. We have to, we have to keep our listening ears on. That's what, that's what Peter is telling us. We have to be careful that we're not taken as, uh, away by false teachers. And there's only one way to find out if a teacher is false or not. Compare it to the Word. You can read the Word. I can read the Word. We ought to know the Word so that we're not taken. You ought to be like the Bereans who when Paul preached, they searched the Scriptures to make sure that he was, he was preaching right, that he was saying the right things. When I preach, you ought to be searching the Scriptures. You ought to take everything I say, and you ought to go make sure that what I'm saying is biblical. It's why, as often as I can, I, I say, look at verse number 9. Look at this. Look at that. Because I want you to see where, where I'm getting what I'm getting from. The Bible is super clear about a lot of things, we need to give ourselves to the reading of it so that we know when somebody says something that just isn't so. And by the way, it's, it happens all, It happens in churches. I, there, I can't tell you the number of times that I've been in church, not as a preacher, but as a listener, and I think, eh, that's not so. That's just not right. That doesn't fit with this verse or that verse or, or the other verse. And so we, you, have to be, you have to keep your ears keen, peeled to make sure that what you're hearing is the absolute truth of God. Just because somebody has been ordained by a denomination or a church and wears a fancy suit and carries a Bible doesn't mean he's speaking for God. The only way that you know they're speaking for God is if you hear them speak God's word. And we have to be, man, we have to be careful, careful that we do those things. Be careful what you read on the internet or in a bookstore or just because it's carried by Lifeway doesn't mean that it's right. I mean, you just, have to, you just have to go back to the Word. It's why, as often as I can, I point you to the Word. So those are the things that I want you to see. You can see that God rescues even as He punishes. And, uh, and, and the, there, there is a very, very problematic passage in this I want to read it again to you, but I'm not going to help you answer it because I don't really have an answer for it. All I can tell you, well, I'll tell you what I can tell you in just a second. So let's, let's listen, let's pick up in verse 17 again. These, that is those who are chasing, who, who are being, who, who their lives are dictated by their own animal instincts. These are springs without water. And mists driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Verse 20. This is the problem. These three verses are problematic for me. For if... After they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. So here, let me tell you first why it's problematic to me. It's not problematic to God. This is God's Word. It's problematic to me because I don't get it. That's, that's the only reason why I'm saying it's problematic. I'm not saying I don't believe it. I'm just saying I don't get it. I don't understand quite how it's so, but it is so. Everybody good with that so far? Everybody understand that I'm not questioning Scripture. I just don't understand this. Y'all good with so far? All right, I don't have a, I don't have a neat little compartment to put this passage in. Second, the reason why I struggle with it is because it says that there are those who come to knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, to me, that means salvation. All right? To me, that means salvation. I don't think it means salvation here, but I'm not sure how. I'm not sure how it doesn't. So, I'm going I'm to answer this, but I'm just, I'm going to walk you through the difficulty first. So then it says, they are again entangled and overcome. 
This means they fall away. They, they turn away. The last state, that is this, this overcome state, is worse than before they were saved. Because it was better for them not to have ever known the righteousness than having known it and then turn away from it. And it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its vomit. I know that's, I've read it three times and I know it's gross each time I've read it, but it's the Bible. And it's true if you've ever seen a dog throw up, they usually go back and take care of it for you. You don't have to, you don't have to run and clean it up. They'll take care of it. That's the picture they're using for an ungodly person who has, according to the word, come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus and then turned back away from it. So here's what Here's what I think. The best way that I can deal with this in my own heart and mind is that these are people who appear to come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They come and belong to the church. They look just like everybody else who's following Jesus, and then they turn away and they leave. To them, that's this person. So the only way I know how to answer it is they've never really come to Christ. They'd never really been born again. But that's not what this says. That's why I struggle with it. That's not what it says. It says they've come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So the best way I know to think of this are people who look like they have. Maybe they've made a public profession of faith. Maybe they've gone through the waters of baptism. Maybe they've led. Maybe they've even preached. Right? They've done, they've done all these things that look just like a Christian would look and then they go back. They've been overcome by the lust of their flesh and they leave. And it, say, it says it's better for them. It would have been better for them never to have been told. Now you say, why would it be better? Because hell is not uniform. Y'all know that, right? Hell, hell is bad. Any part of hell is bad. But there are worse parts of hell than others. And in fact, the Bible teaches all through the New Testament that to know the truth and to refuse it, to them, it'll be required more. In fact, in Jesus' own statement, it'll be required of that, that wicked servant who had a chance, they'll, they'll receive a greater punishment, he says. And I think partly that greater punishment is you knew the truth. You had heard the gospel. You, even, you may have even recognized it as the truth, but you decided you wanted to live for yourself instead of live for Christ. And so now you are punished for all eternity. And by the way, I did it with Noah and the, and the flood. I'll do it with this. Yes, I believe in a literal place called hell reserved for the devil and his angels, but also a place of torment for the ungodly and those who don't come to Christ. I absolutely believe that. And I believe that there... I wouldn't go as far as Dante and say there are different rings in hell. That's not what I mean. I just mean that there are going to be certain punishments that are stronger than others in hell. Just like I believe that in heaven, even though it's all glorious, there are going to be better um, rewards in heaven. I believe that there's going to be, and I don't believe that's going to take away from anybody else. I don't think that the one who, who just gets in by the skin of their teeth uh, is going to uh, you know, okay, I used a, a bad example. For those who are saved, though by fire, that's the biblical statement, they are going to be completely in a glorious place. They're not going to be jealous or envious of anybody else, but they're not going to have the same rewards as someone who has served the Lord and has stored up the rewards for them in heaven. That, by the way, that's all biblical teaching. I, I can do that another time, but there are greater rewards for some in heaven, and there are greater punishments for others in hell. Uh, and, and, and so that, that's what I believe these verses are. Do you have any questions? I know it's tough, and I don't know that I can explain it any better than I have, but does anybody have any questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. 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 
Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You, you have just, in a very good way, explained my problem in understanding. Um, so what Miss Jane said was, um, we, we believe, I believe the Bible teaches that once a person puts their faith in Christ, they are born again, they are a new creature, and they are completely saved. There are two answers that I have that aren't quite um, satisfactory, but they're the best I can do. So, one, if a person is really saved, that they will, that they will be convicted of their, of their following that temptation, and that eventually the Lord will bring them back. Right. No, no, I, I get it. I get it. it said, she said, go back and read verse 9. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. Um, I, I would say that, so my answer is that I believe that the godly will be saved from that temptation and that they won't be overcome in a way that they abandon the faith. All right. So that's one side. The other side is I believe that if a person abandons the faith, walks away from it, then they never really were saved, in the, even if they think they were, even if they think they came to a place or everybody else thinks they came to a place. I believe that the person whose heart is truly changed by the Spirit of God can never be lost. So I agree with you there. My only way, and again, I said this may not be satisfactory, it's just the only way that my mind can understand these these tensions that are held in Scripture, is to say that a person who walks away is, was never saved to begin with. That would, that would be my, my answer. Yeah, that's right. It, it, could have been, it could have been the motive, but it could have been that they never really ex, ex, accepted the Lord. I mean, there, there, is a, there is a sense, I mean, just like I just preached about Judas. Up until, up until John 12, Judas looked just like everybody else did, maybe even to himself, right? And so, so the, the question can never be, it's why when I preach, it's why when I preach a funeral, you'll hear me say this all the time, I expect it to be said at mine based on his profession of faith that Jesus was his Lord, I expect to see Jim Collier in heaven. But you don't know my heart. None of you do. I mean, you can see, you can, you can look at the way that I talk and what I say, and you can think you know me, but you don't really know my heart. In fact, Paul says, I don't even really know my own heart. Now, I believe we can know that we have eternal life. The Bible says that we can know that. But those people who walk away from the faith, they can't have assurance of their faith. They can't have it. First John, and we'll look at this next, next session, First John is so clear that if we continue in sin, God is not in us. And so what that means is, so, so let, me, let, me, let me show you two examples. Jim Collier decides he's going to live for the world now, right? I'm, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of putting up with you Baptists. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of not making any money. I, you know, I'm going to go do my own thing. And I go out and I begin to carouse and live an ungodly life, even if it's not something that anybody else can know, but in my heart, I'm living an ungodly life. And the Spirit of God is saying, Jim, you need to repent. Jim, you can't live like this if you're saved. Jim, if you keep down this way, you're going to head to destruction. Well, I have two choices. When I hear that, and I hear the voice of God, and I think, hmm, he's right. I am in a dangerous spot. I need to repent. Lord, please, please forgive me. I don't want to live that way anymore. Then that proves my salvation. Everybody see that? It proves. I just, but if I run headlong into the world doing whatever I want and I don't hear that voice, that proves 
my lostness that proves that I never did. You see, we have been taught a bad teaching in the Southern Baptist Church. Not once saved, always saved. That's true. That's biblically true. But that all you have to do is walk an aisle, fill out a card, and go through the water of baptism, and you'll surely be saved. That's the problem. Because that doesn't mean you're saved. We have to be careful. That's why I ask every person who comes and joins our church, has there been a day when you've repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus? And you know that without him, you're lost. They have to hear. It's why when kids come and they want, to, they want to be baptized, I ask them, do you know what sin is? Because they have to be reacting to what Jesus offers, with it, which is a rescue from sin. Not just join the church, not just go through the water of baptism, not just to be like your friends, none of those things. So absolutely, Robin, it, it, it's all about the motive, but it's even deeper than that. And it's only ultimately between the person and the Lord. Ultimately, it, it can only sit there. I can't know whether you're saved or not. That's why that joke I make all the time, I wish we had that little blue thing that they put in turkeys, that when you know, the turkey is done, it goes pop, it popped out, right? And you're like, oh, hey, hey, yeah, he's done. He's good. Uh, but we don't have that, which is why I believe, this is the answer to this passage, by the way, the Bible is written so that we won't say, oh, everything's good. And we live at ease in Zion, to quote Amos 6, kick back and not care how we live because we know we're saved. The Bible is written so that we continue to press into Jesus, that we continue to chase after Jesus, that we continue to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And so there is, first of all, I can't condemn somebody. Like if, if, if Jim Collier, use me again, if Jim Collier walked away from everything that you know is, is his life and went out and did things that he shouldn't be doing, if Jim Collier died doing that, I would still, if I were not Jim Collier and I was preaching his funeral, I would still say, you know, there was a time when Jim put their faith in the, his faith in the Lord and we're trusting that because of that, he's in heaven. But I'm not the judge, either for or against. Like, I'm not going to condemn him to hell, and I'm not going to condemn him to, or, or, or promise him heaven. That's not my place. All I can say is he either confessed Christ or he didn't confess Christ. Ultimately, our salvation is between us and the Lord. Paul said we ought to work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling. That means we ought to press in. That's, what, that's, that's the, the word I'm using for pressing in to Christ. We ought to chase after Christ. There's no time that a Christian ought to be able to say, I can do whatever I want because I'm, I'm saved. That's a dangerous spot to be in. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I would say that they're not, uh, I, because I think I think that in order for uh, in order for us to be saved, we have to recognize that we need a savior, and the only way that we need a savior is if we've sinned. Right. It says the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's possible. Yeah. So it's I see what you're saying. So it's possible that someone knows about Jesus but doesn't see why he's necessary for them. Yeah, it could be that too. Um, it's just the phrase, the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is just a strong statement of faith. And, that, and that's why I stumble with it. Uh, I didn't mean to give you my problem. I just know that if I just skipped over this, somebody like Greg Bars is going to say, hey, what about that, preacher? Talk about that. And I don't, I don't know. Like, I don't have a good answer for this. Um, uh, what you said, Miss Jane, is good. What you said, Miss Kathy, is good. What I said is good. I don't have the final, like I can't, I can't say emphatically, this is what that says. Because like what Miss Jane says, I believe. I believe somebody that really comes to Christ is really saved forever. So I am not trying to undermine that teaching. I'm just saying that as we read the whole of the New Testament, and it's not just here in 2 Peter, you're going to see it in 1 John. You'll see it in the book of John. You'll recognize that the call of Scripture is for us to continue to pursue 
not to say, hey, I'm safe. I'm going to kick back and relax. And I think that some people, because of the teaching of once saved, always saved, do just say, well, I'm good. I can go live however I want. And the Bible doesn't let us do that. The Bible is so clear that we have to continue to press into Jesus. Yes, ma'am, Ms. Carol? Right. Yeah, yeah. We'll never know. Yeah, we'll never know. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I, obviously, I am not the judge. And, and it's, it, we all have stories of people that we know who fit this description. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a uh, of an angry God. Um, the but that's why it's by faith. When you press on in faith in the Word of God, by sight of what we don't understand, and we don't know everything. Yeah, yeah, but fra- but 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 faith without works is dead. Uh, there, there has to be fruit that comes from your life. Um, and, and so this is one of the toughest doctrines that we, that we deal with. I absolutely believe that whoever, whoever comes to the Lord will in no wise be cast out. All right, those are Jesus' words. However, what does it mean to come to the Lord? It has to be by faith. We have to come by faith. We have to come recognizing our sinfulness and our neediness in the Lord. It's why the, it's why the Pharisees never could get it. Because just like Miss Kathy said, they did, not, they did not accept the fact that they needed a Savior. They, they thought they were okay. And, and so we just have, it, it's, it's a tension that I try to hold in my, in my preaching. It's not that I want, it's not that I want people to be worried about their salvation. It's that I want them to be worried about their sin, right? And so usually the people who are so sensitive to sermons like this are the ones who are saved. And the ones who are like, man, he's not talking to me. Those are the ones that should be sensitive and aren't. It's, um, it, it, and and this, it, this is not in just one or two or three places. It runs, this, this theme runs throughout the New Testament, which is this, this constant caution about false teaching and about believing false teachers and about following false teachers. Uh, I mean, it's the biggest enemy against Christianity is not some other world religion, not some other governmental power. It's false teaching of Christianity. All through the Bible. That's the, that's, that's the problem, is false teaching. It's, it's not the enemies outside the gate. It's the enemies who have crept in, the wolves who have crept in. Yeah, it's the wicked hearts of those who haven't been. I mean, it's, it's inside. It's not outside. Uh, people often wonder, I get, I get emails fairly often from people saying, when are you going to start preaching against the world? And I'm like, the world's not our problem. We're our problem. And, and as you bring people to Christ from the world, we'll, we'll address the world's problems. But we all know what the world is. That's not the danger. The danger is the lies that are in 
that are that are that'll mislead us. All right, I got to hurry because I I have set to finish Second Peter three. So pick up in ch- chapter three. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Remember, <laughs> remember that remembering is one of his themes. To remind us to go back to the, that's, that's what I try to do when I preach, is to remind us to go back to the solid foundation of Scripture. Verse 2, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when, they're, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded by water. But by his word, the present heavens and fire are being reserved for fire. I'm sorry. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance." But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, (laughs) in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction." You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. I have two things that I want to say about this, and and then we'll be done. The first is I want you to see that he gives us here in these verses the answer to our question that we've just spent 20 minutes talking about. And that is, the way that you know that you're safe is to persevere, to remember, to press on. That's the way that you know that you're safe. By the way, and, and I don't mean to speak ill of anybody, but most of the people that we bring up wanting them to be safe don't care about being safe. Most of the people that we're trying to make an exception for, who maybe sometime in their early years made some decision for the Lord, and now they're living like hell, they don't care. We care because we want them with us, but they don't care. And that in itself is a a damning sentence, that they don't care to be right with God. And the Christian, the one whose heart has been changed, wants to be right with God. That's, that's, the, that's the demonstration of that transformation in our lives. We want to be right with God. And so, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not condemning, but I'm just saying that everything in Scripture points to the fact that we need to continue to pursue Christ forever. And when we find ourselves in sin, uh, to quote Miss Kathy earlier, we brought up 1 John 1, 8, if you say you have no sin... You lie. You lie. But if you confess your sins, you're faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse us, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, ma'am. We would pray that God would break their spirit, <laughs> that God would break their will, and that they would return 
to Christ. That you pray for their salvation. Um, if you ever see me doing anything that's ungodly, you ought to pray for my salvation. That's not, that's not a judgment against me. That's just pray. I mean, that's what best, what, what, what better thing can you pray for somebody than that, than that they're saved? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great prayer. So that's the way I would pray for them. Lord, please, regardless of what it takes, get their attention before it's too late. That's the way, those are exact words that I pray for people that are lost. Lord, regardless of what it takes, get their attention before it's too late. Call them to, call them to yourself, please, Lord. Open their eyes. It says that in Acts that, um, was it Lydia whose, whose eyes, the, the scales fell away from her eyes and that she saw Jesus for who she was? Was that Lydia or Dorcas? Who, anyway, my mind, I, I've forgotten. But Whichever one, that I pray that. Lord, please cause the scales of blindness to fall from their eyes so they see, see for you for who you are. What better thing could you pray for somebody than their salvation? And so that's the way I pray. I, it, it, there is no, look, there is no judgment. I am not the judge. I can't judge. All I can do is see what the Word says and see how we live and pray for their salvation. Pray that they would, they would follow the Lord. In my own life, when I see things that are sinful, and I do, I do see things that are sinful. Fortunately for you, you don't have a, a spotlight into my heart, so you don't see some of the things that I think or do, because that would ruin my testimony. But when I see those things in my life, I confess them and ask the Lord to cleanse me from them. And if they are staggeringly ugly, I'm like, Lord, please, if this is a sign that I'm not saved, save me, right? Yeah, fix it. Lord, please rescue me. Now, that doesn't mean that I, I doubt my salvation. I don't doubt my salvation. I believe in the Lord. And in fact, here's the way I like to think of it. <laughs> if God sends me to hell, he's going to have to do it while I'm holding on to Jesus, right? Because that's, and, and listen, I deserve hell. I deserve hell. My hope is Jesus, and I'm going to hold on to him. He is my plea. He is my, he is my Savior. I'm going to hold on to him. Whatever the, and if the Lord does send me to hell, it's, he's doing it justly because I earned it. But I know, I know that he told me, whoever comes to the Lord will but likewise be not cast out. I believe that. So uh, this is not a doubt. I'm just saying I know my sinfulness. I know I've earned it. But I also know that he promised me that if I put my faith in Jesus, I'll live. And so I hold on to Jesus. I hold on. That's all I can do. There's no, there's no blue thing that pops out of my forehead. There's no, no writing in my Bible that's going to make it so. There's no my mom promising me that she remembers when I trusted Christ. None of that makes me safe. Jesus makes me safe. And I hold on to Jesus. He is the only thing that saves me from my sin, the only person that can save me from my sin, and the only hope. So anyway, that's the first thing I wanted you to see, that he, he comes back and says that. The other thing I want you to see is notice that what he says is, at the coming, the parousia, that word parousia is Peter's word for the second coming of Christ. It really means the appearing. So when Jesus appears, two things are going to happen. Judgment and salvation. Judgment and salvation. The word consummation means the, the, the movement to the new heavens and the new earth. In fact, what we see in Peter's understanding as he writes, there are three ages. Three ages. Uh, by the way, one of the excerpts that I gave you on the, on the piece of paper, the handout, mentioned these three. The first is the then age, what he calls the past age. That was destroyed by the flood, right? You see that. He says, let's see. Yeah, verse 6. Verse 5 and 6. For they, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. So notice, it, by the way, it says that, that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep and that he separated the firmament, the waters above, from the waters below, right? So I believe that when he created the heavens and the earth, it was, the earth was encapsulated by a water barrier, right, above, and there was a water barrier beneath the earth. 
right? Y'all, the, if, you, if you went through Old Testament survey, you remember this. this. This relates to it. He separated the waters above from the waters below. There weren't any earthquakes because the water was like a, a cushion, a shock absorber, right? So there wasn't anything. So the water below, there wasn't any intense heat or intense cold, and people lived for a long time, and they had a lot of, uh, uh, there was a lot of good vegetation because of this terrarium effect of the outward water, right? If you read the flood account, you'll real, realize that waters came up out of the earth. God split the earth. Waters came from beneath. I believe they shot up out of the, out of the ground in, in every direction. And when it hit the vapor that was that it, that had surrounding the earth to protect it, it caused all of it to come back down as rain for 40 days and 40 nights. I believe that's what happened. After the flood, we have earthquakes, we have volcanoes, we have intense scorching heat. People don't live as long as they used to live. I think all of that is because of what happened. God destroyed that first creation, earth, um, heavens and earth, the, the, the immediate heavens around the earth, earth under it immediately, and he destroyed it by flood. And then he promised he'd never do that again. We are now living in the now earth, the now heavens, now earth, that he is going to, des- uh, that he's going to destroy by fire to destroy the ungodly. And that's going to lead to the new heavens and the new earth which will last forever. So in Peter's understanding of history, he sees these three ages marked by destruction and rebirth, if you will, or by destruction and salvation. Flood, he saved seven out of, or eight out of the flood, right? Destruction, salvation. There's going to be a time when he rescues us. He comes back at his appearing, rescues us, destroys the earth with fire. So that's the second, and it's going to lead to the new heavens and new earth that will last forever. That's Peter's view of the day of the Lord. There's more in the handouts that I show you, and, uh, and so, and so we, we see that here. Any questions? Is that cool? Second Peter's pretty nice, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Do I know where water comes from? It comes from rocks. Right. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, the, yeah, God, God created the water. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I don't know that, but it sounds plausible. It, it for sure came out of the ground. Um, uh, Moses spoke to the rock. Well, he didn't speak to the rock. He struck it twice, which was much to his chagrin. But uh, water came. God produced water for that. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Well, that was Second Peter. We'll be back next week. Somebody saw, I, I forgot who it was, and asked me last night, whoever it was, I can't remember, I'm sorry. Um, we were advertising Young Hearts on the 22nd of this month. I am not sure of that Young Hearts date. If it is, if Young Hearts is going to meet on the 22nd, we will not have a New Testament survey on that day. If they are not, and I should know by this Sunday, if they are not, we will have it um, every Thursday this month. So I'll let you know that, but just plan to be back next week. We will pick up in 1 John. We'll be in 1 John a little bit, 2 John not much, 3 John not much, and then Revelation a little bit, and that's where we're headed. So God bless you. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. Thanks for the conversation.